Good afternoon, Howard Wig, Code Green, Think Tech Hawaii. For those of you who are prone to famous songs, the title of today's program is The Green Green Cars of Ohm. And my guest is Lauren Reichelt. She's the Chief Transportation Director. She's moved up in the world for Blue Planet Foundation. And we in the Energy Office work closely with Blue Planet Foundation because we share the common goal of 100% clean electrical energy by the year 2045. We were the first state in the nation to declare that. And of all things, California followed us. Usually California leads in everything. Nope, nope. Hawaii took the lead. And clean electrical energy wasn't good enough for us. So we decided to strive for clean ground transportation energy also. And that's where my guest, Laura Reichelt, comes in because she is going to tell us about lean, as in electric vehicle, ground transportation. Welcome, Laura. Hi, Laura. Hi. thanks for having me. And yeah, we're very honored to have a Blue Planet Foundation member here. Yeah. Why don't you give us a little background about Okay, can you cite the state goal for clean transportation? Sure. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, first, a little background on Blue Planet Foundation. Mm -hmm. So, we are sure. a local yeah. nonprofit organization that's mm -hmm. working to pave the way for 100% clean energy. Um, and we do that through education and advocacy um, and action implementation. So, mm -hmm. as the clean transportation director, I am focused on all of our programs that are working to reduce the petroleum that we're using in our transportation sector. Mm -hmm. um, so we do have the 100% renewable electricity mandate. By 2045, mm -hmm. we will reach that. Um, but in 2017, all four mayors in Hawaii also set goals of 100% renewable ground transportation by 2045. Um, and then three of those mayors also set goals of 100% renewable ground transportation in their own public fleets by 2035. Mm -hmm. So trying to set the tone and, and lead the way on that. Yeah. Um, and so if we go to the next slide, a little bit of, right, so that's Blue Planet Foundation. If we go one more, um, a little bit of information on where we're at in the transportation sector here. So we have a problem here in Hawaii where we rely a lot on petroleum um, quite heavily, and about two-thirds of that goes into transportation. About half of that two-thirds goes to ground transportation. So that means a third of our petroleum use is going to ground transportation, which is more than the electricity sector. So it certainly leaves us with a lot of room for improvement. Um, and that is where, you know, where I come in and where Blue Planet Foundation comes in mm -hmm. and all of our partners in working to create a cleaner transportation system here in Hawaii. And I don't think it's in a slide. Who, who are your partners? We work with a lot of different partners. Mm -hmm. So we, we partner regularly with all of the members of the Drive Electric Hawaii Coalition, mm -hmm. um, including Lupono Initiative, Hawaiian Electric, um, the State Energy Office, the Department of Transportation, um, you know, all of the county representatives. Mm -hmm. We work with private fleets that operate, mm -hmm. um, uh, operate buses, or whether those are tour companies, we work with smaller fleets. We really, Anyone who has a stake in the transportation system, which is essentially everyone, yeah. um, we work with the public a lot. So yeah, we. Yeah, we I, uh, something that impresses me about this program is this wide, wide, wide coalition that, that you put together. Yeah, we. And the wider we, it is, the more powerful it is. Yeah, partnerships yeah. are really important mm -hmm. in the work that we do. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, when we talk about a clean transportation system, if we want to look at the next slide. Um, a clean transportation system is two things. So we both want to reduce the amount that we're traveling all to, or traveling by individual cars altogether. So that's kind of like efficiency in the transportation sector. We want to increase our bus trips and our, our walking trips and our biking trips. But then simultaneously, we want to convert to electric vehicles um, or zero emission vehicles or, or biofuel. We want more sustainable technologies and fuels in the vehicles that are still operating. Um, so a lot of times people want to know why electric vehicles. We do have an uptick in electric vehicles here in the state. Um, and it's because they're extremely efficient to begin with. Um, they have zero tailpipe emissions, so it's great for air quality as well. And then because we have those 
clean energy goals in the state and that mandate for 100% renewable electricity, it dovetails really nicely with electric vehicles because electric vehicles have to be charged from the grid or solar on someone's home. But if they're charged in the grid, that means that they're going to continuously be charged from cleaner and cleaner electricity as we move towards that 100% um, renewables. Let me, let me jump in because you uh, hit a topic very near and dear to my heart. I chair the Hawaii Building Codes Council, and one of the codes that we recently passed was the 2017 National Electrical Code, and we rushed that through because that new code includes four chapters on storage, the proper storage and siting of storage batteries, as in gathering photovoltaic electricity and storing it somewhere. And the deal there is that we have so much photovoltaic with us now that in the middle of a sunny day, the utilities can't throttle their power plants back far enough to accommodate all of that energy, and it gets wasted. Right. So what we do is store that because we still have an evening peak, get it nice and stored up, and address that, shave that peak, as we say, for, for the evening. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It helps. They are, I mean, they're batteries on wheels, essentially. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it can really help us utilize the renewables that are coming in in the mm -hmm. middle of the day that are currently being curtailed or yeah. un we're unable yeah. to use. Yeah. Um, so in that way, it actually helps us reach our clean energy goals even faster, Absolutely. which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the, that's really why Hawaiian Electric offers their time of use rates. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have a slide on here about those as well. So really the, the goal of the time of use rates that Hawaiian Electric offers to electric vehicle own, owners is, is so that folks are incentivized to charge in the middle of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, they want people to use the renewables that are coming in on the grid, so they offer the cheapest charging rate during the day from um, 9 to 5. Um, and then the most expensive, of course, in the evening when everyone's home, turning on their TVs, turning on their lights, cooking dinner. Um, but this can work really well for certain types of people who might be home in the middle of the day. Maybe mm -hmm. they're students mm -hmm. or retirees, or they have flexible schedules, or they work from home. It won't work for everyone, but it is a good, um, a good way of incentivizing that daytime charging and really shows that Hawaiian Electric understands that well, electric there, vehicles are really important for the there, grid. There's another way around that, too. You have those expensive evening uh, charges, but I think the, that medium range kicks in at 10 o'clock at night, something like that. Yep. And generally, you don't need more than eight hours to charge you have a type 2 uh, charger. Right. So set your timer for 10 or 10.30 or whatever in the evening and take advantage of that mid-rate and you're all charged up by the morning. Right. Yeah, yeah you can <laughs> avoid that, that evening rate pretty mm -hmm. easily just by a little bit of strategizing. Yeah. 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 Um, because, yeah, that's a disincentive, right? Mm -hmm. we, you don't want to use And that's why. They don't want you to use that time. Yeah. So, yeah, overnight yeah. is great. If you can charge at home, Plugging in overnight and just topping mm -hmm. off what you drove during the day is a really feasible option. Mm -hmm. People in Hawaii mm -hmm. actually only drive um, on average less than 30 miles per day. Yeah. So yeah. you can just top that off overnight with a slow trickle charge in your garage. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of people work during the day and so they yeah. can't actually charge during the day unless there's charging available publicly or at mm -hmm. workplaces. Mm -hmm. So um, we need charging available at those workplaces and places where people will be during the day, parking lots, things like that. So if we show the next slide, um, Hawaiian Electric actually has a DC fast charging program where they're installing fast chargers across the state. Mm -hmm. They currently have nine on Oahu. They look just like that picture in the middle there. Um, but in general, you know, we have a pretty strong char public charging infrastructure relative to other states. We're actually second mm -hmm. in the country per capita, um, EV chargers per capita. But we do need more. EV yep. adoption is just increasing so quickly. Um, and so we really need to identify funding streams for new public chargers. Um, and we need to identify workplaces and, and public lot owners that are willing to install those chargers. Um, luckily, there was an EV charger rebate program that was passed at the legislature this year. Mm -hmm. So that'll be um, available for public, public charger installation or upgrades for level two chargers and for DC fast chargers. So if any businesses want to install those, that 
uh, rebate program will kick in at the beginning of 2020 and will be a really good so, option to help offset that initial upfront insulation that, that's cost. That's just three months from now. Yeah, yeah it's yeah, soon. That's good. Um, and it'll only go on until the funds run out. So if anyone is interested in installing those public chargers, it's good mm -hmm. to um, get the project started now so that installation takes place early next year and they can take advantage of that rebate. And is that HECO that's managing the program? or It's Hawaii, um, Hawaii Energy. Oh, oh yep. yeah. So they're good, good making fit. their foray into transportation. Good fit, good fit. Yeah, absolutely. And let me put in another word about chargers. I'm the energy codes guy for the state. And one of the amendments, you have the, your national code, and then it's given to the states, and the states are free to amend. And Hawaii was one of the first states to amend by saying, when you have new multifamily structures, as in high-rise apartments or uh, many townhouses, that 25% of all those new parking lots must be EV ready, meaning there's, as you're putting all your electrical installations in, there's a conduit that goes to the parking lots and then it goes up into the individual spaces and then there's a little plug there. And when you're ready to install your charger, you just doop, 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 unscrew the plug and then boom. There's your connection just uh, waiting for you. Yeah. That's step one. Step two, individual single-family residences. Likewise, a charging station, charge EV ready in your garage. Is this the bill that's being heard right now? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So yeah. I think a really important distinction there, too, is what's EV ready, right? We're not mm -hmm, saying mm -hmm. that you need to install a charger. Mm -hmm. um, if we can pull up the next slide... This is a good, yeah. just highlights yes, yes, yes. the difference. So mm -hmm. EV ready, really, like you said, Howard, is just mm -hmm. having the electrical capacity set up mm -hmm. to um, install chargers later and having the wiring and conduit in place so that when you're ready to put in a charger, you can just pop a charger right on there, mm -hmm. hook it up to that outlet that already exists. Um, and in the end, that really supports easy, low-cost installation mm -hmm. of EV chargers mm -hmm. because you're doing it on the front end when the building is being built. Mm -hmm. um, if you wait and you don't make the building EV ready, mm -hmm. then it can cost up to 90% more, yeah. um, which really is more expensive for the condominium owner or the apartment dweller or the property owner. Um, so you're future-proofing your building. EVs are coming, and so it's really mm -hmm. um, a good forward-thinking policy to have in place to be sure that mm -hmm. folks who live in multi-unit dwellings can take advantage of electric vehicles because there's an option for them to easily install a charger. Easily and inexpensively, and I'll make a little correction for you. You said 90% cost more. It's 900%, nine times the cost. As, as we're going, hearing the uh, city council consider this bill, We've had people living in high-rises who want to install uh, EV-ready or EV installations in their parking garage. They get horrendous uh, cost estimate. Yeah, I've heard like $35,000. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, really yep. high numbers. Mm -hmm. And other areas have implemented similar policies. Yeah. Vancouver has 100% mm -hmm. stalls. Um, Atlanta is 20% and single-family homes. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's also worth noting on single-family homes, everyone's concerned about cost of living here in Hawaii, but installing that conduit mm -hmm. is the equivalent of a dryer outlet. It's a 240-volt outlet. It's not saying you have to have a charger installed. Mm -hmm. It's really one extra wire. Yeah. And so it doesn't add much cost if any, to the home of a home, yeah. or to the, co yeah, to the cost of a home being built. And, you know, the, the ground is open, the walls are open, everything's open, and the electricians are busy installing those uh, conduits anyway. Yeah. This is just one more conduit. Right, exactly. And then a little, some extra capacity in, in your amperage uh, going into the house. Right. Because they have to size as if everything is going all, all at one time. Right. Yeah, yeah this is important. Mm-hmm. And on that cheery note, we do need to take a break. Howard Wig, Think Tech Hawaii, back in a moment. Hi guys, I'm your host Lillian Kumik from Lillian's Vegan World. I'm, I come to you live every second Friday from 3 p.m. And this is the show where I talk about the plant-based lifestyle and veganism. So we go through recipes, some upcoming events, uh, information about health, regarding your health, 
And uh, just some ideas on how you can have a better lifestyle, eat healthier and have fun at the same time. So do join me. I look forward to seeing you and uh, aloha. Aloha, I'm Melly James, host of Let's Mana Up. Tuesdays, every other Tuesday from 11 to 11.30. This show is meant to dive into stories of local product entrepreneurs and how they're growing their companies from right here in Hawaii. I'm so thrilled to have our show kicked off. And so please join us on Tuesdays at 11 o'clock as we talk to local entrepreneurs and hear their stories. Welcome back, Howard Wake, Code Green, Sync Tech Hawaii. Lauren Reichelt, Director of Clean Transportation for the Blue Planet Foundation. Well, we're just getting really warmed up here, Lauren. So we're talking about uh, the fact that we want as many, many EV outlets as possible. That's one right. thing that's slowing down the growth of EVs is not enough outlets yeah. and what do you call it Ra range anxiety yeah. and, and so perceived forth. range anxiety who, who range? perceived range perceived anxiety range anxiety yeah because yeah. as i'm yeah as i mentioned people in hawaii mm -hmm. really only drive 30 miles a day yeah. on average and so there are a lot of people who don't own evs that could mm -hmm. be really mm -hmm. easy adopters mm -hmm. of evs because they don't drive that far to begin with yeah. so um i think people assume you know oh it only has 150 200 mile range mm -hmm. i'm gonna run out of that so quickly but you're yeah. not driving as far as you think you yeah. are every yeah. day um but yeah. then and also is there a charging station in haleiwa now or is that just planned or there is there's yeah. a yeah. dc yeah. fast charger in haleiwa now mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. and then you know we're talking about this charging infrastructure and it's true that's that is a limiting factor because people if you don't see where the chargers are you don't know mm -hmm. um you don't know where to go you, you think that there are few and far between so they're maybe not as visible um but you know it's worth noting that the people who are relying on that public charging network there's a whole other segment of people who don't actually have to rely on that public charging network nearly as much um, if ever and those are the folks that have single family homes mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. anyone who lives in a single family home is kind of in an easy adopter they can plug in at night like we mentioned before just in a normal 120 volt outlet and top off whatever they drove throughout the day mm -hmm. um, which for a lot of folks will get you to a full charge every evening when you're at home you'll never have to stop at a gas station it's extremely mm -hmm. convenient. You may or may not be able to opt into those Hawaiian Electric time of use rates if it works for you. Um, you know, it's really just, you know, people will say like, how long does it take to charge your car? And really mm -hmm. it takes five seconds, right? You pull into your driveway and you plug it in. Well, now that brings us to a discussion of level one, level two, level three. It, I don't think you explained that in a later slide, do you? No. Yeah, so what? Can you, can you run us through that? Sure. So level one charging is called trickle charge. It's mm -hmm. at a 120 volt outlet, a normal outlet. Every electric vehicle comes with a plug for that. Um, it'll give you anywhere from five, around five miles per hour, five to 10 miles per hour. Um, you know, it's a slow charge. So that's the thing that you'll plug in into your house overnight mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you might be able to top off what you drove throughout yeah. the day. Or if you say the uh the medium rate starts at 10 p.m uh start it then just with a timer you don't have to go out into the garage and flick a switch or anything yeah absolutely and then it goes till six seven a.m that's eight nine hours that's right eight eight times five that's 40 miles most of us don't even dream of driving 40 miles in a day not if you live in town yeah um and then level two is a bit faster so mm -hmm. Level two is often what you'll find at public charging locations. Um, it's not super fast, mm -hmm. but it's mid range. It'll help you get where you need to go. You might plug in at a level two charger when you go to Target, run in for mm -hmm. 30 minutes, and then come back out and you'll have a bit more, more range. Mm -hmm. It may have offset what you drove. Um, and they're also the level that folks will install at their house. Yeah. Um, you can get a level two charger on Amazon for anywhere from $500 to $1,000. And you can install that in your house, and it might double the speed of your charging from your slow trickle charge. Mm -hmm. um, so if you do have a little bit of a longer range, that might be a good option for you to help placate that range anxiety yeah, yeah, a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. 
Or, and then, or say, say you're going to a movie, you're going to a restaurant. Uh, right. Perfect, yeah. And then the DC fast charger is what we call level three charging. Um, and that is the fastest level of charging that's available. Um, it's expensive to install, so people don't have them at home, and they're a little bit fewer and far between publicly, but that is the level that Hawaiian Electric has installed across the state, the nine DC fast chargers that they have across Oahu. Mm -hmm. um, and those will fully charge an electric vehicle anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour. Um, and so that's really good when you're in kind of a pickle, when you mm -hmm. maybe have been driving all day or you went up to North Shore and you're kind of running out of battery, you just want some peace of mind, or maybe you know, it's necessary to stop at the Dole Plantation and plug in for 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so those are the three charging um, levels and a combination of all three, they have different use cases obviously, so a combination of all three is what's gonna create a really strong public mm -hmm. charging network. And that's why it's really important that we think about this now and we make sure that our charging network is built by design mm -hmm. and not by default later when yep, there's so yep. many electric vehicles on the road that we're just throwing chargers around mm -hmm. wherever they might end up and, and it maybe ends up as a system that's not the most efficient or it's useful more expensive and it's yeah. more expensive yeah. Yeah. yeah so that brings up a related sort of controversy people plugging in to a public charger in the morning and just leaving it all day long especially level three. Something that occurs to me is if you had a level three, you'd uh, you know, sort of automatically hook into your, your iPhone. And after 20 minutes or whatever it's charged, you go beep, 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 beep. And oh my God. And there's no way to turn the thing off until you unplug it. Yeah. That'd be one way to control Wouldn't it. Wouldn't that be great? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I do hear about that issue. I also mm -hmm. hear about that at level two chargers at people's workplaces where there's only a couple of chargers and someone will plug in in the morning and leave it all day. Mm -hmm. Or there's a system where they're like calling their friends mm -hmm. who then come in with their EV. And so the people who really need it can't get in because they have a whole system going on. Um, there are a lot of issues. It's a new technology and a new charging system. So mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. we're still working out the kinks and um, the charger operators are still working out the kinks and figuring out how to, either, maybe they make a charger that shuts off after a certain amount of time. Um, and disconnect so that a person can pull up next to you and, and take it out. Or, um, oh, and there could be an indicator up there. Yeah. Or, or it or starts whatever. to charge yeah. you after two hours. Mm -hmm. And you're getting charged at a rate that you're not, you don't want to leave your car there anymore yeah. because it's yeah. so expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they need to work out a system where people don't just yeah. take advantage of the chargers. Another issue is people parking in an EV charging stall that's... Um, has a charger there mm -hmm. because it's close to the front of a store, mm -hmm. but then not actually charging. Mm -hmm. I'll see that a lot too. Give that person, a, <laughs> I was going to say, a $50 ticket. How about a $100 well, ticket? Well, they should know better. They have a, an EV, right? They yeah, should understand. Yeah. But hmm. yeah, interesting scenarios yeah, occurring, yeah, but yeah, I'm yeah, sure yeah. it'll all work itself yeah, out. These are growing pains. Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. And um, I think, do we have one or two more slides have, left over? Yeah, here? we no. have. Yeah. Yep, we got through oh, that yeah. one. A little delayed. Well, yep, this one I think is the last one. So mm -hmm. um, there are some other, aside from infrastructure, there are some other incentives um, to incentivize electric vehicles. And currently there's one incentive on the books where electric vehicles or plug-in hybrids that have an electric vehicle plate get mm -hmm. free access or free parking in city and county lots mm -hmm. and at the metered stalls, um, free parking at the airport up to 30 days. And then they also get access to the HOV lane on the freeway, even if you're all alone in your car. Mm -hmm. um, and that's been, you know, great in drumming up some early interest yeah, and yeah, it yeah. helped, you know, that parking can really help offset a oh, car yeah. payment, things like that. But those incentives are set to sunset next year in June. So they will be um, going away unless the legislature um, you know, recognizes that we're only at 1% electric vehicles mm -hmm. on the road. Mm -hmm. um, and we really have a long way to go to reach our goals and we, sh we still should be incentivizing. Yeah. So hopefully they'll recognize that and they'll extend those benefits further. And my, my experience tells me that it's much easier to amend an existing law than it is to create a whole new law. So in this case, it would be just 
extend for another two years or something. You know? Right. Yeah. Extend. Yeah. If they, you know, if you want to tweak it a little bit, like mm -hmm. you said, it's easier to, to tweak something that exists yeah. than it is to yeah. create yeah. something yeah. from scratch. A lot less controversy, um, and people are used to it. And the opponents, by then, hopefully, will have just kind of gone away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, last year. Um, they, the legislature passed an additional $50 registration fee on electric vehicles as well. So that's an mm -hmm. annual registration fee. After the first registration fee, they don't pay at the first one, but every subsequent year they'll pay. Um, so, you know, the incentive's going away, and mm -hmm. they're already kind of instating some additional fees. And so, you know, if we're trying to encourage clean energy mm -hmm. and clean transportation, mm -hmm. and if that's the goals of the state, then really need to be incentivizing in transportation. You, you know what? You heard it from me first. Blue Planet will be uh, spending a lot of time at the legislature on this. And, that is yeah, possible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, the Hawaii Energy Office has its uh, clean transportation center, so yeah. they will probably be active as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And oh, another question, uh, rental. Any Rental car companies offer EVs yet? or um, There is a company on Kauai specifically mm -hmm. that offers electric vehicle rental cars. Um, I know that Enterprise Rental Car did pilot some electric vehicles back in 2012, but um, they no longer offer electric vehicles, and none of the mm -hmm. rental car companies have really taken it upon themselves to, mm -hmm. to work on that yet. And this is really a, the same conversation about infrastructure. So we're building yep. the new yep. comrack yep. rack yep. at the airport, and there are no EV chargers incorporated into that. And so that was something that was planned you know, a decade ago or however long ago, mm -hmm. and they didn't build that in, thinking about the future. And now mm -hmm. those rental car companies can say, well, we don't have anywhere to charge the electric vehicles. And they don't feel comfortable purchasing mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. um, it's a prime example of why we need to be looking yep, forward, yep, yep, and yep. new builds should all be incorporating at least EV ready so that it's an easy mm -hmm. upgrade as opposed mm -hmm. to a complete remodel, tear it apart, and rebuild. Yep, yeah, at many times the initial cost. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And we just have a few seconds left. Any parting words of uh, wisdom? Um, buy an electric vehicle, <laughs> they are a lot of fun to drive. <laughs> Um, and there is public infrastructure, and if you live in a single-family home, then you don't really have to rely on that as much anyways. And your um, per-mile cost is much less than is the case for a gasoline-burning vehicle, I believe. You do save money. Even though electricity is expensive here, you do save money compared to gasoline. Okay. And on that very, very cheery note, thank you, Lauren Reichelt. This is Farewell from Code Green, Think Tech Hawaii. See you next time.